We are going to be in the book of Judges today, right? Judges 4 through 5. So if you've got a Bible, feel free to open it up. If you've got an iPhone, iPad, I recommend the version Bible on the apps there. Uh, there are some in the pews. If you don't own one, there's some on the uh, Welcome Center that you are welcome to take and keep for your very own. Um, it's a blue Bible, not this blue Bible, but about this color. They're on the Welcome Center. Feel free to take those. If you know somebody in your life who doesn't have a Bible, take one and give it to them. I have more. I will continue to replenish the supply. They're like magic Bibles. When they disappear, I make more reappear. Just like that. Okay? So we want to be a blessing. want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to have their own Bible. But we're going to be in Judges 4, Judges 4 and 5 for the duration of the morning. I'll reference a few other places, but that's where we're going to pretty much hang out for this morning. So um, we're going to be looking at the story of Deborah. Last week I started a sermon series. Uh, We're going to be looking at some just extraordinary women of faith in the Bible. And we started with that last week, and we're going to continue this on through, give or take, Labor Day weekend in September. So Um, I'm excited to preach this, and I think it's a great message, and I think there's some tremendously wonderful life application from this story to our own um, practice of life. Now, if uh, you're a movie-going sort, you may remember this is an older movie now. Um, I was thinking about it the other day. And there was a movie, I want to say 20 years ago. That doesn't sound like it was that long ago, but it seems like it was a long time ago. But it was a movie called Courage Under Fire. Does anybody remember the movie? It was, it was Meg Ryan and Denzel Washington. Um, she was a helicopter pilot. Do you remember that? Anyone? Just me? Okay, well, I'll tell you about it. So that's what I get to do. Anyhow, so, so Meg Ryan is this helicopter pilot who, uh, who was killed, shot down, while she was trying to rescue a group of soldiers. Now, Denzel Washington uh, plays an investigator whose responsibility is to determine whether or not uh, the character played by Meg Ryan deserves to receive posthumously the Medal of Honor. And then the movie, as you watch it, has all sorts of different twists. It's, it's, it's a very interesting movie. Um, and, and come to find out as he digs and does the background work and as he studies her heroicism uh, that she was truly worthy of this Medal of Honor, which at the end of the movie, I'm going to give you a spoiler because it's 20 years old, the end of the movie, uh, the Medal of Honor is presented to her daughter. And it's a very touching scene in the movie. Uh, as we study Deborah, it brings to mind the same idea, this, this idea of courage under fire. Um, but before we dig into her story specifically, let me kind of set the backdrop for you so you understand what's going on. Throughout the story of the Old Testament, God's people seem to go through a, a cycle. If you're in Bible study with me, you'll hear me reference this pretty frequently. Um, and this was especially true at the time of Judges. After Joshua died, right, Joshua took over from Moses, and then after Joshua dies, the Israelites, they really are kind of just floating. They, they don't have a, a solid leader. They begin to lose their way, and they just kind of begin to drift. I mean, Moses, Moses was a strong leader. Moses didn't want to be a leader, but Moses was a strong leader. Joshua, Joshua was selected, and Joshua was raised up, and you know Joshua... Don't fear, don't fear, don't fear. God keeps telling Joshua, don't be afraid, right? And Joshua leads very well. And then he dies, and they're just kind of a ship without a rudder. And they just kind of begin to lose direction as a nation, Israel does, in their faith. And in Judges 2.11, it describes what was happening. It says, Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals, or they served the false gods of the people living in the promised land. And this cycle is, is once again, illuminated for us then in, in Judges chapter 4 as well. Israel, you see, they'd been delivered from their enemies. There was peace in the land. Everything seemed to be going well. But then what happens time and time again in Israel is when things are going well, they forget all about God, right? Right? And they begin to turn to other gods. They begin to turn to idols. And in Judges 4, 1 through 3, it says, Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sights of the Lord, after Ehud had died. See, Ehud was their leader, and and as long as Ehud was alive, he was able to lead the people and, and get them to obey and worship the Lord. But as soon as he dies, the people begin to immediately compromise with worldly things and immoral lifestyles and, and they begin to 
partner and join in with their neighbors, something that God had strictly forbidden, in worship and in other things. And so this new generation comes and soon they begin to intermarry with unbelievers, which again was, was prohibited by God. And they begin as they intermarry and intermingle and they start to take on the surrounding cultures, they begin to fall into immoral ways and lawless ways of the surrounding world. Verses 2 through 3 in, in Judges uh, 4 there says, what, says, it continues on and says, what God did as a result of this, that, and the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, and there won't be a test on this later, so don't worry. But So he reigned in Hazor, and the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth, Hyagim. And the sons of Israel, they cried out to the Lord, for he had 900 iron chariots. And he oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 20 years. You see, God was basically left with no choice but to either chastise or punish his people to discipline them. Um, We as parents understand this, right? If you're a parent, you understand there's times where you have to take corrective action in your child so that whatever the behavior is, it won't get worse, right? We've all been there as parents, except for maybe Jesus' mom and dad. Other than that, the rest of us, we've, we've had to do this, right? Where our kids aren't perfect and we have to say, all right, there's a punishment, there's a consequence, you've done this, now this is going to happen. And this is the place where we find in the story God is at. He had to awaken them. He had to, had to arouse their, their passion for him again so that they would repent and they would turn away from evil before they destroyed themselves completely. Well, how does God do this frequently in the Old Testament? Well, the primary way he does this is whenever the Israelites turned away from God, whenever they began to cease worshiping him and began to serve other false gods, they would lose God's protection. And he would allow one of the neighboring foreign nations to come in and conquer them. And that was never a good thing for the people of Israel. To put it in the New Testament terminology, they were reaping what they were sowing, right? The Israelites had chosen the ways of the world and consequently they were reaping the ways of the world. Now, during this particular time, uh, the man that God used to conquer the Israelites, as I mentioned, was a man by the name of Jabin. He was the king of Canaan. He subjected Israel under his rule. He oppressed them, it says, for 20 long years. So, as is often the case in the Old Testament, the Israelites were a little bit slow to figure out that they were the problem. It took them 20 years to figure out. Why 20 years? Well, 20 years is, is a generation. It took an entire generation before somebody went, hold on a second, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, right? And he had subjected them for 20 years. What we sow, we reap. If we sow evil, we we reap evil. And then as a result of that, God disciplines us. And he will turn us over to our desires if that's what we want. He will, he will let us pursue foolishly our, our lusts, our immoralities. He'll let us become slaves to sin. But then he brings discipline. And often the discipline comes actually to break us because we need to know that we are broken before we can be healed, right? We don't, we don't, turn from our folly until we realize it's a folly. And so sometimes God does let us hit rock bottom. And sometimes when you get that low, sometimes when you are at the bottom of the well, the only place you can look is up, right? What choice do you have left? So sometimes God uses that, and frequently he uses that to the nation of Israel to discipline them, to convince them to repent, to turn away from their sins as he does with us. Proverbs three eleven through 12 says this. It says, my son, this is Solomon's wisdom. He says, my son, do not, do not loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects his son in whom he delights. See, God cares. And so because he cares, he disciplines. 
I, I, I've said this to my son on numerous occasions when I've had to discipline him for whatever, and I say, buddy, I'm doing this actually because I love you, and I want you to know that. I'm not being mean to you. I just can't let this continue. And whether or not that helps, I never know. But at least I try. Well, the pain of suffering for 20 long years finally breaks through, right? 20 years of suffering. Finally, somebody goes, oh, we've been sinful. We've been stubborn. Finally, the Israelites begin to get a little bit of a clue. For verse 3, it says that they cried out to the Lord. They turned to him. They repented concerning their sin and evil that they had been committing. And, and they were now where God wanted them finally to be. Praying. Praying to him. Seeking him, right? Longing for the return of his presence in their lives. Longing for God to guide them once again. This discipline that God had brought them finally had worked its purpose. The Israelites were once again now finally focusing on the Lord, right? They were in captivity. They were finally looking to God again instead of the surrounding world. When we turn away from our sin, when we face the Lord, when we cry out to him for help, God hears us and God helps us when we repent of those sins. See, the the power of sin, the, the problem we have, the difficulty, the suffering, the brokenness of our lives can be overcome by the power of God. And so this leads us into our our introduction here into Deborah, the woman who showed tremendous courage under fire. Verse 4 says this. It says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. Why do you think God uses Deborah? You ever ask that question? My suspicion is that it very likely could be that she was the only one who was really listening to God at this time. It is, it's probably accurate to say that the deeds and the faith of, of the other women at this time and the other men at this time simply didn't measure up. And particularly a problem among the men because the men had been called to be the leaders of this time. And yet they're nowhere to be found in the story as leaders. And because of that, God gives us Deborah, this extraordinary woman. And her vision of the world is not shaped just by the political situation of her day, but by her relationship with God. Now, normally at this time, women were not political leaders. She stands out as an exceptional exception to that. Deborah was exactly what Israel needed. A woman who heard from God and believed in him and believed what he said would come true. And so God had asked her to do this at, at great cost to herself personally, and she acts in faith. She's brave. She's intelligent. She's trustworthy. She's confident of God's word and of his presence in her life, in the life of Israel. And so she rules Israel from sitting underneath a palm tree. Scripture tells us a palm tree that even bears her name. And you see, so as she's there judging the Israelites will come to her. They come to her with their problems. They come to her with their disputes. That's where we get the name of the book of Judges from. But you need to understand she is so much more than just simply an arbitrator. She's a prophetess. Uh, She's one who acts between God and, and his people, letting his people know his will. If you study names in the Old Testament, and I mention this frequently, names are important. The name Deborah means bee, you know, like a bumblebee or a honeybee, right? The name Deborah means bee. And Matthew Henry points this out, if you use his commentary, that that her name suggests the very work of a bee. If if you've watched bees, they are hardworking, right? They're industrious, they're they're sharp, they work together, they, they, they have great discernment, and they can perceive when a threat is coming to the hive and all sorts of other things. And then they're incredibly useful, and they can, of course, at times be very, very sweet. They make honey, right? And so... These bees are are such a a great example, and her name literally means to be a bee. And Deborah serves us as this godly example of a a servant-like heart and her willingness to serve God at any cost. Whatever God calls her to do, she steps up and she does it. 
So let's notice four different things about this woman who knew what God's vision was for her life. If you're taking notes, the first one here is that Deborah was a woman of great character. Judges 4, 4 through 5 says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time, and she used to sit under this palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel came up for her judgment. This was a normal thing in the time of the life of Israel. Deborah sets up court. The people come to her. They have their disputes settled. And we learn here not only that she served God as a prophetess, we'll learn later on that she serves also a leader in the military. Then on top of that, she's a wife and she's a mother. She's a judge. She's got a lot of irons in the fire. This is a busy lady, right? One, one commentator points out that from between the times of Moses and Samuel, no other person fulfills all of these rules other than Deborah, which speaks incredibly highly to her character. An amazing, amazing woman. When people looked at Deborah, they see this lady standing firm in the Lord. She stands on God's word as a, a great example to Israel. Now my question is, when people look at us, do they see someone like Deborah? When they look at you, do they see the character of one who stands firm on the Lord? Having character doesn't always mean that we don't make mistakes, but it does mean that we are always committed to live for Jesus. Always. And if we do that, other people are able to see it. And that was one of the hallmarks of who Deborah was. She stood firm on her faith, and others could see it. She stood as a beacon, as a lighthouse of faith, standing out among her peers. And I can't help but think that is the reason in which God had selected her out of the many people and used her as he did. She was standing firm in her faith, and God could trust her. What an amazing mark of character. The second thing we see in the story of Deborah here is that she was a woman of great confidence, Judges 4, 6 through 7 says this. Now she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinam, from Kedesh, Nephthali. Like I said, no tests on this later. And said to him, Behold, the Lord God of Israel has commanded, Go, march to Mount Tabor, and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Nephthali and from the sons of Zebulun. And I will draw out to you Caesarea, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his many troops to the river, Kishon, and I will give him him into your hands. So God comes to her and says, here's the plan. This is how I am going to set you and my people free. Okay? Deborah speaks for God to the people. She calls Barak and says, here's the task that God has given me. God is responding to our cries. God has heard that we are repenting after 20 long years of our own stupidity and foolishness, God has heard us crying. And he is going to deliver us from oppression. And Deborah believed it, that no matter what the odds were, that God was going to bring them freedom. So she says to him, I will give, she, she, she tells him what God says, God says, I will give him Caesarea into your hands. So let's look at Barak's response. Verse 8. It says, then Barak said to her, if you, Deborah, will go with me, then I'll go do this, right? But if you're not going to go, mm -mm, I'm not going to go. Now, it would be easy to jump on his back, right? And say, well, why don't you just go and do it, right? Deborah said, God said, right? But how easy is it for us to be in the same boat? How, how many times in our own lives have we said, well, maybe I could do that, I don't know. Or, 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 or even better, yeah, here's one that we often do. We say, God, give me a sign, right? You give me a sign, then I'll do it, right? Make it, make it clear, God, that this is where you're calling me. Like, I don't know, flashing neon sign, God, might make it clear enough for me to go and do what you're calling me to do. Anybody else like that? I'm like that. I'm not a big leap of faith kind of guy lots of times in my life. And, and sometimes I need more than just 
that little prompting of the Spirit. I need the spiritual two-by-four up against the side of the head. Right? Anybody else like that? Or is it just me? I, I, I'm a little slow there. I'll admit it. I'll admit it. You, you can see my history. God working amazing things in my life, often despite me, and often despite my desire for him to show me great things so I know I'm going the right direction, right? It would be so much easier following God if... You remember those commercials on TV where, where they would have that green path for investment? Right? So, so if God, God gave me this green path of spiritual enlightenment, and I, I just follow it, wherever, wherever I follow this green path, then, then I know God's leading there, so I'm safe to go, right? But the truth of the matter is we don't get that. We don't get that sort of clarity. We don't get that sort of confidence. Occasionally, yeah, sure. I've had moments of clarity. I mean, I, I've had a couple where God just kind of went, boom, and he kicked the door open, and it was like, dummy, this is obvious. If you don't see it, you're going to miss out. I went, yes, Lord, I will go with you this way. More often than not, though, that's not how faith goes. And so we don't just want to jump on his back because at first Barak doesn't go, oh, yeah, if you said God said, let's go do this. Let's go fight this war. I mean, they got us outnumbered like four to one, and they got the bigger chariots, and they got the bigger guys, and they got the sharp knives, and ah, we'll still take them anyhow, right? On paper, it would have been a suicide mission. But he says, well, Deborah, if you put some skin in the game, if you go, then I'll go. Then I know that God actually is calling us to go and do this. And so Deborah goes, well, okay, if that's how it's going to be, that's what we'll do. See, Breck is the leader of Israel as far as the military goes, but he's not willing to do this on his own. He's not willing to make that leap of faith on his own. But Deborah, once again, as I said, is this woman of great courage. And she says, all right, God has called us to it. We're going to do it. And off we go. On his own strength, Barak had every reason to believe they would fail. But what he was missing was something that Deborah had said to him earlier. Deborah says to him, God said I will give him, the enemy's ruler, the enemy's leader, I will give him into your hands. Barak didn't fully believe this. And so Deborah, in verse 9, she says, All right, surely I'll go with you. Nevertheless, the honor, because of this, shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take. For the Lord will sell Caesarea into the hands of a woman. See, had had he jumped out and said, All right, let's go, God says so he would have gotten all the honor. He would have been this great leader, right? But he's got a little bit of doubt, a little weak in the knees. And so he misses out on a portion of God's blessing because of his doubt. And so Deborah once again proves her faith and her confidence in God by going along with Barak into this battle. And I love what Psalm 27 through 8 says, Some boast in chariots and some boast in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Deborah had great character. She had great confidence. And third, Deborah was a woman of great courage, as I mentioned. The end of verse 9 says this, Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And not only that, but she also went with the 10,000 soldiers into battle, we see in verse 10. Then the news begins to spread that Caesarea's side, that, uh, that, that, that this attack is coming from Israel. They, they begin to get word of it. And so let's pick it up in verse 14, where, where time had come for the Israelites to attack. Deborah says to Barak, he says, she says, Arise, for this is the day in which the Lord has given Caesarea into your hands. Behold, the Lord has gone out before you. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with his 10,000 men following him. And it says, and this is important, see these words. It says, the Lord routed Sisera and all of his chariots and all of his army with the edge of his sword before Barak. He couldn't claim any of it. And Sisera alighted from his chariot. He jumped off of his chariot, right? And he fled away on foot. But it says, but Barak pursued the chariot and the army as far as Herosheth Hagoyim. 
and all of the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword, and not even one was left. The courage of Deborah stands as a dynamic example for us, for all women and men everywhere. I mean, just imagine trying to mobilize an army of basically unskilled, unarmed men. They had been conquered, remember? It wasn't like they could just call up the National Guard and say, yeah, let's get together and go start a war. No. For 20 long years, they had been subject to the Southern nation. And now they're saying, we're going to rise up against this mighty military, against these people who just smashed us 20 years ago. And, and, and not only that, they've got the latest technology, right? They've got 900 chariots of iron. Now, in this day and age, a chariot doesn't sound like a big deal. But imagine going to war and God calls you and me to go out and fight with hand-to-hand and with just rifles and pistols against a bunch of tanks, right? You stand there all day with a pistol, you're not going to do any damage to a tank. And that's kind of what these guys are being called to. This other army has an overwhelming advantage. But you see, there is no room in the service of God for being faint-hearted. There's no room for us to be fearful or unbelieving. If God calls us to it, he will be in it as we pursue it. God commands us to be courageous, to step out in faith, and to faith the enemy with courage and with boldness, no matter whom or, or what the circumstances might be. And if God has helped us and and promised that he will deliver us, we need to boldly go and confront that enemy. And so as Israel moved forward in faith with God, it says the battle, it was already won. Did you catch that in verse 15? King Jabin's army and Sisera were humiliated, demolished. There wasn't a man left standing. Sisera sees what's happening. He jumps off of his chariot. He starts running on foot, right? He gets his rear end handed to him in this battle. But then it continues on. This is in the story that Cicero felt secure enough. He, he runs away. He goes and takes refuge. He goes into this tent. And in this tent, it's being overseen by this woman by the name of Jael. And Jael was the wife of Herber the Kenite, which again, doesn't mean anything probably to you, but a friend of King Jabin. And so this military leader thinks, yeah, I'm going to go hide out in this tent. I'll be safe there. She's a friend, or at least her husband is a friend of the king. But look at how the story ends. Verse 21. It says, but Jael, Herber's wife, This is an interesting story in scripture. She took a tent peg, right? You know what a tent peg is, right? Big old like whittled stick with a pointy end. You hammer it. She took a tent peg. She seized a hammer in her hand and went secretly to him and drove it through his temple while he was sleeping. Pretty effective methodology of taking out this leader. He was so sound asleep from this battle, he was exhausted, Scripture says. And when she pounds the peg in, of course, it says, so he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man you are seeking. And he entered with her, and behold, Sisera was lying dead with a tent peg in his temple. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the sons of Israel. And the hands of the son of Israel pressed heavier and heavier upon Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. Deborah started the victory, and Jael sealed it. Two women get all the credit and all the glory. Not a single man in the story. Two women come and rise up to be the heroes of Israel. Now, you might think this is unique, but if you study your Bible, there are so many accomplished, amazing women of courage in the Bible that, that frankly, we'll spend a few more weeks talking about them because of it. 
And they do amazing things. And she did this amazing thing because she had faith. And because of that, this woman jail receives all the honor instead of the military leader, not Barak, as Deborah had said. Yes, Deborah was this woman of great character, and she had tremendous confidence, incredible courage. And then finally, and I think this is probably the most important point in the story today, she was a woman of great compliments. So all this transpires, the war is won. What happens next? Judges 5, 1 through 3 says this, Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinaham, sang on that day, saying that the leaders of Israel, the leaders led in Israel, that the people volunteered, bless the Lord, right? Hear, O kings, give ear, O rulers, I to the Lord. I will sing and I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel. The very first thing that Deborah does following this miraculous defeat of their enemies is she compliments, she praises the Lord. I don't know, maybe, again, I'm unique in this experience, but how often are you suffering through something, struggling through something, wondering when, when, Lord, Will this relent? And finally, the, the, the dam breaks. And finally, whatever it is goes away. The, the, the relationship is restored. The money comes in. The heart is healed. Or whatever it is, is fixed. What is your first response? Your first response should be, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, God. Praise the Lord. Is that our first response? When we have been suffering, struggling, tormented in trial, and finally the dam breaks, do we praise the Lord? speaks a lot about who we are and what we believe about our God if we do. The very first thing, after insurmountable odds are overcome, after they are delivered, after 20 years of oppression. She doesn't say, let's party. She doesn't say, give me all the glory, honor, and praise. No. She says, praise the Lord. Thank you, God. But notice what else Deborah does. She compliments and praises the people for their help. Look again at Judges 5.2. That the leaders led in Israel. That the people volunteered. Bless the Lord. See, the people willingly offered themselves. See, while the numbers were staggeringly against them, they rose up an army of 10,000. People willingly offered themselves, knowing the odds were not in their favor, but knowing that God might work mightily through them. And so she praises them as well. God calls us to the very same thing today. We can do the very same thing, yes. We're not oppressed. I'm not asking you today to rise up and take arms and let's go to war. Anybody ready for that? I think that's one of those things I'm going to need a big sign from God, right? <laughs> I'm not calling you to that. But God still calls us to do great things. And we still, like they did, have the opportunity to work hand in hand, together, shoulder to shoulder, serving God, being the body of Christ, doing far more together than we could ever do individually. But for us to be successful... For us to be able to do what God is going and is calling us to do, we need to be just like Israel. We need to be a people with a repentant heart. We need to be a people willing to listen and obey God. 
See, we too can learn some very valuable truths from Deborah. If we, as the Israelites, would repent and call on the name of the Lord, incredible things can be done, insurmountable odds can be overcome. So maybe you find yourself in life in a place where something's just, you've been struggling, hurting, ailing, aching, wondering, when will this end? Turn to God. Repent. Call upon Him. And see what He will do. Those are the prerequisites for God to work in our lives. We must repent and call on Him if we want to be delivered. Turn away from evil. Turn to the Lord. Give God all of the credit, realizing all good comes from Him, and oftentimes He is the only one who can do anything about it. If we can do that just like they did that, then God can take and use us in amazing ways we could never dream. And I know God wants to use us. So my challenge to you today is if you find yourself in that place, today, maybe the next day, or maybe next year, or 10 years from now, I don't know when, but if you find yourself in that place where you're struggling, where you're hurting, where things just... You're not making the ground you think you need to be making. Dig in, reflect, repent, and call upon the Lord and see what he will do. Amen. Let's pray.